A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on September 2nd, 2020. Can you believe it's September already? I cannot. (laughs) I'm Anna Garcia, your host, and this is a monumental episode for a lot of reasons. One, thank you to all of you because this week we hit 4 million subscribers on our YouTube channel. So I thank you all for coming back, subscribing. We couldn't do this without you. It's a really big episode. Plus, there is a case that I investigated that has an arrest. This is a guy on the FBI's 10 most wanted, so I can't wait to dive into this. But first, our guest is criminal defense attorney, Danielle Iredale from San Diego. Danielle, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So before you were a criminal defense attorney here in California, you were a public defender in New York City. What was that like? I always tell people it was the best four years of my life. My, uh, my clients were awesome and they were the perfect kind of clients for a new attorney uh, who had more balls than brains, if I can say that. They were thrilled to go to trial. They were thrilled to hold the government to their burden. Uh, and I'm really forever grateful for them. Oh, that's fantastic. I can't wait to get your take on the two cases we have this week. So this is what we're going to dive into. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's son is facing almost 10 years in prison for stabbing a neighbor over a dispute over a trash can. And as we all know, arguments between neighbors can get really heated. But our first case, a father who allegedly killed his two daughters in what has been called an honor killing has finally been arrested. He was on the run for 12 years. 63-year-old Yasser Abdel Saeed was taken into custody in Justin, Texas on August 26. I can't tell you how relieved I am to announce his capture. This is a case that I investigated for Crime Watch Daily three years ago, and it is a case that haunted me because of the details and the level of abuse in this family. So, Saeed was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted. There are a lot of people that the FBI are looking for, but that 10 most wanted list is their priority. And he'd been on that list since 2014. This was after he was accused of murdering his two teenage daughters, Amina, 18, and Sarah, 17. Police at the time said, and they still believe this, that this was an honor killing. They said that the father killed his daughters because they disrespected him because they wanted American boyfriends and they were not Muslim. Now, what you need to know about Yasser Saeed is that he was born in Egypt. Um, He had moved to the United States, had lived in Texas for most of his life, but he remained very traditional. And for him, his daughters, even though they were born and raised in the United States, they were going to be very traditional Arab Muslim and he even tried to get them married off. I mean, he was he kept trying to take them back to Egypt to get like, you know, a, a good amount of money for them, you know, like a dowry. Yeah. So um, and obviously they were raised here and they had, you know, different views on things. So, Danielle, when we get into the details of this, first, there is the incredible way that the FBI tracked him down. So that that's going to be part of the story. But before we get to that, I really want to do a deep dive into this case and the details of it, because it really is horrific. And if you look at the pattern from the very beginning, I think you'll get the totality of the case. I think that's right. Okay. So in 2017 for Crime Watch Daily, I traveled to Oklahoma and I traveled to Texas for answers. Now, I really at the time had a hard time believing that the guy, the dad had just vanished. But as it turns out now, based on what the FBI has just released this week, when I was in Texas... So is he. And details. Right? It's it's too much. It's it, it's too much. It is too much. And everyone kept saying, like, well, you know, he probably fled the country. Well, he may have and returned on a brother's passport or something, but it does appear for the last few years he's been living in Texas. And and you wonder what kind of psychology that is. 
right? You wonder, does he maybe think he did nothing wrong? And, and I, I do want to say, and, and I have to say this as a criminal defense attorney, that this is going to be a very difficult case for whoever takes it on. It will be an attorney who is, I imagine, a very skilled capital defense attorney. Uh, this is in Texas, so I imagine they're going to be seeking the death penalty. And one of the first things I thought about this case, and, and we can talk about right the initial guilt phase, but really what I thought about as a criminal defense attorney, that this is the kind of case that takes you to the outer edges of your principle. Why do I do this job? Right, 85% of my clients, I do this job because they deserve a good defense, because they are good people who happened on unfortunate circumstances. And the other 15, I do this job because I believe are in our criminal justice system. And I believe it's flawed, but it's one of the best in the world. And if we're going to have a country that has these kind of punishments, we have to have people who are going to offer you know, the best defense. And sometimes that's not about guilt or innocence. It's about punishment. Yeah. Well, of course, he is presumed innocent in this case. Um, but I got to tell you, <laughs> he looks awfully suspicious to me. And I got a lot of problems with this guy. And when you hear some of the history, you're going to have a lot of problems with his, with him too. So what we uncovered in our investigation is that Yasser Saeed had been sexually abusing his daughter's four years. And he was also both physically and sexually abusive toward his wife. And he terrorized his family, terrorized them. And what is amazing is that it's not just them saying it, it's that he made a bunch of videotapes. He was always videotaping his daughters in a really creepy way, both in front of them and also when they didn't know it. So uh, like when you look at these home videos, he'll, he'll, uh, make a comment about how beautiful um, his daughter's eyes are or her butt or her legs. And you see the girls like trying to pull down their t-shirt and pull blankets over their legs. Like you can feel the discomfort and it just creeps me out to no end, especially when we get into the allegations that were brought to the authorities. This is the part that also undoes me. Okay, so let's get into the history of this family and you will find this also disturbing. Their mother, the girl's mother, was a child bride. She was only 15 years old when she married Yasser. Is the, I mean, this is unbelievable. She married him with the permission of her father. He was 29 years old. He was living in Texas. He told the father, I can provide for her. I can take care of her. I have money. I have land. The guy's working as a taxi cab driver. Okay. The father says, okay, you can have my 15-year-old daughter. And that is the beginning, I believe, of all of the horrible things that were to come. Absolutely. I have to tell you, Anna, that was, that was the moment for me. A 15-year-old girl is a child. For her to go and be with someone who's purportedly abusive, and I think we'll get into this later, but how damaged was this woman who then herself became a mother? And we look at her and say, how could you not protect your children? Which is a natural inclination, right? I jump in front of a train for my son. I, I, I just know I would. But this is someone who's been beat down before her brain could even develop. Before she even could get judgment, she was put with this man who, by all accounts, even by photos, and, and that's something that's difficult. I don't know why our clients sometimes create evidence to use against themselves, but from your previous specials, the photos were truly disturbing. Really disturbing. Just, I mean, the whole thing is just so creepy. It really, really is. Um, yeah. So that's the beginning of it, okay? A child bride. This is the mother of the girls. So I want to go back to the day that the girls were murdered, and then we're going to give you even more family history about this. So New Year's Day, January 1st, 2008, 18-year-old Amina, 17-year-old Sarah were found shot to death in their father's taxi cab. And by the time the cops got there, daddy was long gone. Police say that Amina was shot twice. Sarah was shot nine times. And the fact that the father abandoned the taxi cab with his daughters inside, he left the taxi cab at the Omni Hotel at the taxi stand, if you can imagine. 
And it is such a disturbing crime because what you have to understand is Sarah, who was not yet dead, but her dad had left, managed to call 911, identify her shooter as her father, but because it took so long to get to them, the girls were dead by the time the paramedics got there. So here is one of the clips from the original investigation on Crime Watch Daily. A terrified 17-year-old girl pleads for her life as she's being murdered. Oh my God. We hear cries and then silence. And when the bloody bodies of Sarah Saeed and her 18-year-old sister Amina are found riddled with bullets in an abandoned taxi, investigators launch an international manhunt for the missing driver, the two teenagers' own father. Who would think that their father would kill them? I think it takes a pretty evil person to murder your two daughters. He's a monster. I don't think that monster is a strong enough description for this man. It's just not good enough. The, the, the voice of this young girl and her will to live calling 911 was, to me, if I was the prosecutor, that's the first thing I'd play in my opening statement, and it's the last thing I'd play in my closing argument. It is so soul-crushingly upsetting and you look at these girls and when you look at the pictures of them living under this oppression, but they were glowing. They were really beautiful, young, smart girls. Um, and to just hear in her voice the desperation and the will to live is heartbreaking. And as an attorney, I can't help but think, and, and I practice in California, so I look at our exceptions, this 911 call would be admissible, right? We always hear about hearsay and what can come in and what can't. And the law is designed to allow these dying declarations to come in. And if this was a California case, I imagine Texas has a similar statute. This kind of call is going to come in and it's not going to be subject to what's called confrontation clause exceptions because she was calling for help. The law decided if you're calling for help, you're not calling to point a finger. You're calling, she was calling to live. Also, Danielle, the fact that when you hear the entire 911 call that she says she identifies her shooter, that her father shot her, how damning is that for the pro- – well, how damning is it in court, meaning, you know, to help get a conviction? That – the chilling nature of the statement, the fact that her father is obviously recognizable to her – now, of course, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. And if we were doing this case and we had to mount a defense, I can think of an argument. Perhaps this is someone else who is holding her at gunpoint and threatening her and saying, you must say, this is my dad. We've all heard of stories that seem insane and then are true. Uh, but the bottom line is this is extremely damning evidence and it's the hardest kind of evidence to confront because it's damning factually and it's feelings. Really, jurors convict or acquit based on feelings, not facts. And this is something that is gut-wrenching. It makes your body almost kind of want to kneel over. It, it really does. And those girls, when you think about it, they did everything right. They uh, excelled academically. They were in sports. <clears throat> they did everything they could to be the best that they could. They had boyfriends, which they hid from their dad. You know, they, they were just working in the most oppressive of, of situations. And what they didn't know at the time, like they had jobs, you know, teenage girls in high school have jobs. The father would sit outside of these like convenience stores where they worked and he would be videotaping them and watching how they dealt with and conversed with the customers. And he would make these nasty comments about, wait till she gets home. I'm going to tell her no smiling at people. I mean, it's just like really obsessive, crazy stuff. It's incredibly obsessive behavior. And, and I think you're, you're going to talk about this, but, and I want to know what you think about the mother's role in all of this, because I know that people 
you know, it's an, it's, it's almost an interesting thing, right? I was reading some comments and people almost seemed more upset at the mother than the man who allegedly pulled the trigger. And, um, you know, we know these girls tried to get away and that their mother was the one who brought them back and, and was their mother bringing them back to a death sentence? That's, that's my, per, my personal opinion. Absolutely. Yes. Is she a victim in this? Absolutely. She was victimized by him and she has lost her two beautiful daughters. But I'm sorry, I hold her accountable for the safety of those girls. She was their mother. She was morally, ethically, legally responsible to, to take care of those girls the entire time that they were growing up. And when she buckled to his, to his pressure, and again, I know she was a victim of domestic violence, but she had taken those girls, and we're going to get into how they escaped. They escaped, and he got to her, convinced her to come back. She brought those girls back into his arms, and the following day, he killed them. And I hold her responsible. I do. There's no way around it. I, I, I definitely respect your view. I, I think a lot of people see it that way, certainly in terms of child protective services, child welfare services, Children are taken away when one parent, who's perhaps not abusive, fails to protect them, right? Legally, the state can do something beyond taking your own liberty, right? Something that's maybe worse than that. Take your child for failing to protect. And that is under the auspices of child abuse. But I can't help think that this woman was so debilitated by, what, 20 years? 20 yes. plus years of, of abuse. and. And, and, and what kind of defense we could mount, we'll see. It, it still remains to be seen whether the mother will be charged. I, I surmise most likely at times the government will charge the mother so that they can get her to flip because she, unfortunately, those girls can't stand up and testify for themselves. But if the government had a way, some way to force her to testify and a very good way is to get out from criminal charges yourself. Perhaps they'd want to use her in the trial against Saeed. Uh, she was absolutely abused. And no, she could not have been thinking straight. And she was a victim. I, I, that is not lost on me. And I do have a lot of sympathy for her. But the fact that she was away in another state and it was just a phone call that she could have, she could have somehow, and I know the threats must have been horrible, but I wish she hadn't brought those girls back. I have that's to agree it. with you. That, that is the part. Back. That that's the part that undoes me. That that's the part that I hold her responsible for. She made a conscious decision and she tricked them because she lied to them. She lied to them. We're gonna get to the lie she told them to get those girls to go back. Oh gosh, it really upsets me. So uh, now I I, I want to talk a little bit more about. The monsters, the family calls him. So for the next 12 years after the murder, he was on the run, hiding from police. Apparently, he was being helped by his brother and his son. We don't often talk about the boy, but there were the two girls, Sarah, Amina, and then there was the brother, Islam. He was treated completely differently by the father. He, we don't know whether he was abused or not, but he got everything. He could do anything he wanted. He was the chosen one. And isn't it interesting? He was 19 years old when his sisters were murdered. And isn't it interesting that he is the one who helped to protect his father? It just shows the dynamics of this family about how messed up everything is. I was also very interested in that, right? This was, why does my sibling get to do it times a thousand? He almost grew up in a different house within the same house. I also have to tell you, I these kind of dynamics always, always really pull at my heartstrings when we have a mother of one of my clients who there's a threat that she's going to be charged for hiding out her son. And it's one of those difficult lines between morality, your heart, and the law. Can, can someone turn in their own father, their own son? In this case, I also think the son was psychologically manipulated and abused by the father. I, I imagine no matter what, as a human being, he must be heartbroken over the loss of his sisters. Is he afraid it's going to happen to him? I can't help but feel defensive of the son. And, and also, 
I would argue it would have been the right thing to do to turn him in. It, it would have been the right thing to do. Could, could he have done it? Should he have done it? Probably. I can understand that in the beginning when he was 19 years old and everything happened and, and it was an unbelievable tragedy and he's trying to figure out what to do. He is young. I, I, I will give him that. But he's had 12 years to think about it. Okay. He's had 12 years. And then there's absolutely no excuse for Yasser's brother, who's an adult. There's like no excuse for the rest of the family. We may give him um, a little bit of leeway because he probably himself was somehow victimized, uh, you know, and, and was terrorized by his father. Even if he was given everything, I'm sure he was very manipulative. So I, I will give you that. But he's had 12 years to think about it. 12 years. Okay, so let's go into their upbringing a little bit. So Sarah and Amina were born in the U.S. They grew up in Texas. They're Texas girls. The mother was a Southern Baptist. The father, a Muslim from Egypt. It's important to look at the culture here. Their mother, as I said, Patricia Owens, was only 15 years old when she married. She said that as soon as they got married, it became an abusive relationship. Um, she said that he resented her American family and always tried to separate her from her family. She could only visit with his family, not her family. And um, he he was violent with her. And she also said that as far as she knows, he had at least six affairs that she knew of. Okay, so just add more disrespect on top of violence, on top of more disrespect. And isolating her from the family is something that we see a lot in these relationships. And and something I meant to mention before is Saeed's proclivities. Could the prosecutor argue with respect to, I think we'll talk later about the accusations of the daughters, but what 29-year-old man is attracted to a 15-year-old girl, right? I, that's illegal most places when there's not a marriage. And that's a whole nother topic about the legality of child marriages, right? Something yeah, yeah. we don't even have time for now. But that, that fact, and you said it, I think you said it perfectly. That really is, that's where it started. That it was it. If you could point to the moment when you said it was written, it was then. So her relatives, Patricia, the mother's relatives, say that they knew that the father was abusing the girls because the girls had told the mother's relatives. So this is Aunt Jill. This is what she told me when I interviewed her about the sexual abuse. Here's the clip. They told their grandmother, uh, Patricia's mother, that Yeser had been messing with them. And by that, them. by that you mean sexually? Sexually abusing them, yes. Mom Patricia moved out with the kids and reported the incident to the police. They talked to Amina, they talked to Sarah. You had to get the transcript mm -hmm. and read it. You'd mm -hmm. be shocked at what these little girls said that he did to them. We did in fact read the police report and yes, the girls actually accused their father of raping them. So here's the amazing thing, they did. They went to the police, they went to the Hill County Sheriff's Department and they made a police report about the rapes. And the aunt goes on to say that the father and the mother, Patricia, convinced the girls to recant their story. And this is the part I have a problem with. The police accepted it. They said, okay, sure. I'm glad you brought that up. So this is one of the areas that I practice in a lot because it's fraught with improper accusation, but also accusations that are thereafter improperly recanted. So it's almost this impossible position. How do we do the right thing, right? How does society do the right thing? We hear all the time about cases in which there's a divorce and one of the spouses is coaching a child to make allegations. And these kind of allegations stick to you no matter what happens. It sticks to you and is life ruining, right? And then the, the punishment and the sentences are so draconian. And there's a big fear, I think, of putting someone away for something they didn't do. Now, in this case, I, I have the privilege of not being a juror. I can just be a person. I can just be a human. And these are the kind of things that make you want to rip out your hair. 
because it's up to the police and it's up to the prosecutor. And I have had to go to trial on cases. This is so common in domestic violence cases where the alleged victim does recant. Because people say in this country, people say the complaining witness doesn't want to press charges. And that's a complete misnomer. The crimes are against the state or the federal government. So there is no reason why the prosecutor could not have gone forward with this case. And maybe that would have put these allegations out here. Who knows what what would have happened? And again, we see the mother and the mother's role. Is she complicit in this? She She took them. She took them. She took them to the police. That was the right thing to do. The girls told the family about the abuse. The mother moved out, took them to the police. That was the right thing to do. But then it looks like Yasser got to her, got to the girls, threatened them, and everybody changed their story. And it's it's easy to believe the allegations when you watch the real creepy isn't. There's not a good enough word for those videos of him and his no. There isn't. There isn't. And we will link to them so you could see them. It's like four or five parts that I did on this. And it's it's definitely worth watching if you are interested in more details on this case. So going to the police did not stop Yasser Saeed from his behavior. If anything, according to the family, it made everything worse. He ramped up the violence. Do you see that a lot, Danielle? Look, could it have emboldened him? Did he do the unspeakable thing? and then get away with it. There's an argument for that, right? And now he saw that his wife and his daughters were willing to go to the police, were willing to seek outside help. So maybe he doubled down and maybe he thought, I need to really increase my reign of terror. Yeah. So he, he now he's stalking the daughters as they're getting older. He tracked their cell phones. He tracked, he went through their stuff, their books. These girls were so smart that they had like a double life. They had secret phones that they kept in their school locker. They had code names for their friends and their boyfriends. And um, they never used the same names because if they received a call, he would go through their phone, call that person back and find out who they were. And they would really fear for their lives. They would not just for their own lives, but they would fear for the lives of those they interacted with. They thought their father was capable of doing that. And, you know, another interesting thing, this was mid early 2000s. So think about how much scarier and how much more of a panoptic in society we live in now, right? He was able to track them, keep eyes on them, take these videos. If they had an iPhone, he could have easily put on Find My Friends and seen them at every location. He could have installed surreptitious cameras all around the house, right? We have cameras now that are the size of a pinky fingernail. So I think about how much scarier this kind of behavior can be today. So the abuse is escalating. Here is another clip from my original investigation. Yasser Saeed rolls the camera as daughter Amina eerily points his gun at him. Perhaps the very same weapon he would allegedly soon use to shoot Amina and her sister Sarah to death in a taxi. And maybe also the same gun their Aunt Jill says Yasser used to terrify, intimidate, and threaten the teenagers when he would fly into wild fits of rage. He would wake them girls up in the middle of the night waving a gun, threatening them that they were going to do what he says or he was killing them. So clearly based on these videos, these home videos, there was a gun, maybe more guns, and he had no problems flashing it, giving it to the girls. It was horrible. It is really chilling to watch those videos. The, you know, the other thing I think about in hindsight's 2020, but gun laws. And if he maybe had a conviction, would he be barred from owning a firearm? Would it matter, right? Because we know to him go to whatever length. No. But I, I, I couldn't help but think about that when I saw the gun in these videos. So Amina, you know, they both had secret... Um, boyfriends, but Amina was desperately in love with a boy. They were so in love and she confided in him and his mother 
She had sent them emails. She had told them how horrible the father was, and the mother was trying to help, and so was the boyfriend. So um, I'm wondering, in these emails where Amina herself describes the level of abuse um, that, and those emails were sent, again, to the mother of the boyfriend, will that be helpful in convicting him? So that's a that's a great question, and I, I might have checked my California evidence code to give you some answers on this. Now, here's gonna here's what's gonna be the question, and it's a question of how close in time can this be? So, in a way, they're dying declarations, and certainly the 9/11 call, right, with Sarah on the line is gonna come in because that's a statement respecting the circumstances of their death. They have personal knowledge, and it's a sense of impending death. So if I were trying to get these in or try to keep these out in California, to me, the argument is sense of impending death. This father allegedly took the act that we don't want to even imagine is possible. When you read the letters, it does seem like these girls have the sense of impending death. He's going to kill me. What else is that? In fact, uh, the father found a letter that Amina was writing to her boyfriend. When he discovered it, he went ballistic. He beat her in the most savage way. And then he takes the family and they move 20 miles away. That was his reaction. And and the boyfriend hadn't heard from her, didn't know what was going on, was in a panic, thought maybe she was dead. And he beat her and he beat her and he beat her and he wanted the name of the boy and she wouldn't give it up. She protected him him to the very end because she knew her father and his brothers would go and kill him. I have to tell you, I can't get that out of my head. This brave, brave, beautiful soul. That for me is another fact that I I can't get over to think about how earnest and in love and selfless, literally being beat by a grown man And she loved this boy so much, and she was so scared for him that she wouldn't give up the name. Oh, and you know, when I tell you that this investigation has haunted me, it really has. It bothers me at my core. And and I think what is the most devastating and the most painful for me is that they almost got away, right? The girls almost had freedom and safety. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to get back on track, but it just, it just, the details of this story are just so painful. So, a few weeks before the murders, um, the girls, the two sisters were concocting a plan. They were going to run away, right? Because, you know, one of them was already 18 and they're like, we're out of here. We got to go. What is unclear to me is when they were hatching this plan to run away, somehow their mother, Patricia, became a part of the plan, and she wanted to go with them. And my guess is, in their hearts, these good girls saw how badly their mother was abused, and they couldn't leave her behind because probably their leaving would mean an even worse beating for her the minute he discovered it, right? That's that's right. There's a role reversal almost to their peril. And it speaks to how the fortitude of these young girls, right? These girls are teenagers and they could have just run away and saved themselves, but instead they want to look out for their mother. And it was to their peril because as we know, their mother tricked them in the end. And sometimes no matter what, we want to believe the best in people. And even if we know what's going to happen, we still can't believe it until it's too late. I'm, sh- I'm sure they wanted to think our mom's going to protect us. She's not going to do the wrong thing. So they, they moved to, to o- right. So they moved to Oklahoma. Patricia gets an apartment. This is the mom under a different name. She gets rid of all of their phones. She gets brand new phones, and they are living in safety. Here's what's unclear. Somehow, the mother either must have called. Yasser, because she must have gotten a message from someone because he probably was threatening the police for taking the children. Who knows what? Somehow, the mother breaks with the protocol of remaining safe and secret, and she talks to the father. And then he starts in with the abuse and the control again, and he convinces her she has to come back. It is now Christmas week, and the mother says to the daughters, I need to go back for Christmas, for the holidays. 
I want to do this. I want to do that. I promise you, we're not going back to the house and I'm not telling your father. And the girls have, they share that they have, uh, you know, a lot of reservations about doing this, but they go. And then when they finally get back and they get back the day before they're murdered, they get back on New Year's Eve. Then the mother says, well, your dad wants to see you. And one of them freaks out and says, no way, no way. I'm not going. I'm, I'm hiding out. Right. I'm not I'm not going. And somehow, whether it's the mother, the sister or the father convinces them, he says to the girls, I just want to take you out for dinner and to talk. And the girls agree. And what does he do? He puts them in the cab. And that's the night that he killed them. Just, it takes your breath away. It really takes your breath away. So clearly the mother tricked them. And that's the part I have a problem with because she lied to them. She tricked them. She put them in danger. And I guess to save herself, I understand she was abused. Um, and then, of course, you know, this brings us full circle back to the 911 call. And Sarah manages to identify her killer. Now, here's what's interesting. Somehow, while he's on the run these 12 years, Patricia Owens manages to get a divorce from Yasser. Okay, I don't know how that works. I guess if the other person doesn't show up and is missing, I guess you can just get a divorce. I, I'm thinking, but it's, it's interesting that this is the time when she's able to do that or has the thought to do that rather than before all of this happened. Yes. And she herself, the mother maintains that this was an honor killing because she said that the girls had brought shame on the father. So she, while some people dispute whether this is an honor killing or not, she and other members of the family say it was. There's this great documentary on this case, and we we were very grateful to be working with them and, and to be able to use some of their videos. It's called The Price of Honor. I suggest you see this documentary because you'll hear long interviews with friends, the boyfriends, the mother. It's heartbreaking because that that young man, um, I mean, his boyfriend has never been the same again. He's never been able to recover from this, from the level of violence, the fact that she was murdered, the fact that he felt helpless, that he couldn't help her. I, it just, it, it's a great documentary, The Price of Honor. I highly recommend you see it. Okay, now let's talk about how Yasser Saeed was captured. Because just when you think this story is done, no, there's more. All right. So remember, he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. He got on that list in 2014. But back in 2017, the year I went to Texas on this story, a maintenance worker at the Copper Canyon Apartments in North Texas says he recognized Yasser Saeed from you know, the fact from the murder, it was highly publicized, the FBI's list. And he was in an apartment that was rented by Yasser's son. Okay, duh. How, I mean, it's all sitting there. It's all sitting there for you. Okay, remember, this is the son, Islam. So the worker went in there to fix some water pipe that was broken. That evening, the FBI shows up, knocks on the door, and the son won't let the FBI in. They don't have a warrant on them. They're knocking. He won't let them in. You know who's hiding in the back. So the FBI goes, gets the warrant, comes back at one in the morning. No one's answering the door. They break in. And as they make their way through the apartment, they see that the glass patio doors in the back of the apartment are open. Someone's eyeglasses are in a bush and it looks like someone jumped and ran. So the FBI grabs some evidence and starts to gather DNA. They want to know if this is Yasser Saeed. Mm -hmm. Of course, because of familial DNA, it's not completely clear, but they think they have Yasser. But the bottom line is they don't have him because he's disappeared again. Okay, two weeks later. I mean, I'm really, I'm coming undone here. Two weeks later, Yasser's son, all right, the one who rented the apartment, Islam, is spotted at the U.S.-Canada border trying to cross. And when the agents asked him, you know, hey, what's the purpose of your trip? He says, quote, I'm on a crazy road trip. 
Now, he was with someone else. We don't know for sure that that was Yasser, but why else would he be trying to cross the border? Who else is he going to have in the car? I got to say, the statement's factually accurate. (laughs) (laughs) I can defend him on that. (laughs) I agree with you there, Danielle. (laughs) That is one crazy road trip. (laughs) Okay, so now this is two close calls, right? In two weeks, two close calls. The FBI misses him by, you know, just moments. They try to make a run for the border. Miss him again. All right. Now let's get to August last month, August 17th. The FBI is now watching a house. Okay. The FBI finds out that one of the relatives in the Saeed family has purchased a house. So they start doing some surveillance. And they see Yasser's brother and Yasser's son carrying grocery bags into the house. And then as they're watching them, they see the two carry trash bags out of the house, not into the trash can, but into the trunk of the car. Okay? Suspicious. So the FBI follows them. They, they get another search warrant and they follow them. They go somewhere 20 miles away to a strip mall. And they dump the trash. When they dump the trash, the FBI collects it and they take the DNA from the trash and they match it to the DNA from the apartment three years earlier. Bingo! Yasser Saeed is still in Texas. But they need to get their guy, right? The DNA in the trash, I think it's how they got the Golden State Killer also. Exactly, exactly. exactly. I mean, this is just, I mean, this entire case is unbelievable. So once they figured they had enough evidence and they thought for sure that someone was in the house because the, as the FBI was surveilling the house, they said they kept seeing a shadowy figure, but no one else leaving or coming. So they raid the house and who do they find in a back room? Dear Yasser Saeed hiding. They, they had, um, they had made like a little fake room in the back converted garage with a little cot And that's where he was living. He was captured in Justin, Texas. There is justice in Justin, Texas. He was captured on August 26. He is now sitting in the Dallas County Jail, and he could get the death penalty if convicted of the murders of his two daughters. But we are not done yet. Now let's talk about his alleged accomplices. The FBI also arrested Yasser's 32-year-old son, Islam, who clearly hasn't grown up much and his 59-year-old brother for concealing a fugitive, and each of them faces up to five years if convicted. Do you think that either one of them is going to turn? I think they're going to turn so fast, we're not even going to know what hit us. Because anything our clients say, anything the defendant says, is admissible in court. It's one of those unfair rules, right? It's called an admission, kind of no matter what. So... I surmise if Saeed is in fact guilty, that he probably discussed this a few times, right? And that's great evidence to put the son or the brother on the stand. And the prosecutor can just ask, what did he say? And all of that is going to be admissible. (sighs) Well, the FBI says they're not done yet because they believe there were more family members who were helping these 12 years, and they want to bring more charges. Honestly, I hope they haul them all in for helping this guy hide. Because it couldn't have just happened with these two. There must have been an entire network to hide this guy. I, I will say it'll be interesting to see what facts come out and and what he's been doing for these past 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, we, also, we also want to say... Um, that the U.S. attorney who was handling this case said, thankfully, their day of reckoning has finally come. And both Yasser Saeed, Yasser's brother, and his son um, have all retained attorneys. They are public defenders. And the attorney assigned to Yasser said, and this is, quote, we come at it from the assumption that he is innocent of the crime And the attorneys for the brother and the son had no comment. I guess, what else is the guy going to say? So I can't help myself. I got to say two things. First of all, public defenders, whoop, whoop. The best (laughs) attorneys in the courtroom, usually. And the second thing is, shame on the U.S. attorney. 
he shouldn't say the day of reckoning because that presumes guilt. And there's interesting thoughts about, you know, publicity, but one of the main things that I thought about in this case is how's he going to get a fair trial? And, and let's not assume anything now. Um, but it is nice, I will admit sometimes, to just get to stand back and say, what a tragedy to think about these young women, these victims, to, to celebrate their life as much as possible and just to kind of get to be a citizen and not have to be in the courtroom. But I will say, I would not hesitate to represent him. And it's not because we condone any of the allegations here, but it's because he is entitled to the best defense because each and every one of us are. And how a society treats its most reviled is really a sign of what kind of humanity, compassion, and, and how much we care about justice. I, I really do believe that. Well, I do believe that while justice for Amina and Sarah has been delayed, there will be justice for them. There will be justice. And I am so glad that this man has been apprehended. And I'm going to watch this case like a hawk. And um, yeah. I look forward I, to your further coverage on this. I really, I, I really do. I take these things personally because they are heartbreaking. And yes, I do advocate for the victims. I absolutely do. And yes, everyone is entitled and is presumed innocent. But, you know, I'm just glad this guy is charged and is going to stand, stand in a courtroom. I, I yeah. can co-sign that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Danielle, our next case involves celebrities and a dispute over trash cans. Adam Abdul-Jabbar, who is the son of basketball great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, has been charged with multiple felonies after allegedly stabbing his neighbor over an argument over trash cans. This happened in the Southern California community of San Clemente, and apparently the two live next to each other. And they share a driveway. And apparently there has been a dispute for years over trash cans, when you pull them in, when you pull them out. And for those of us, you know, who live in the world of pulling trash cans in and out and dealing with community stuff, I mean, neighbors do go crazy over stuff. They do. They sure they do. do. They do. I mean, they, it's amazing the level of violence that can happen from a neighbor's dispute. And it boils and it festers. So, and this one was going on for a few years. All right. So on, on June 9th of 2020, 28-year-old Abdul-Jabbar allegedly stabbed his 60-year-old neighbor, Ray Windsor, multiple times with a large hunting knife. Uh, Windsor also suffered a fractured skull. And I was looking at some video last night and um, the victim's abdomen, he's got like this massive cut all around his belly. It's it's horrific to look at. So here, here's what happened, Danielle. The altercation occurred after Windsor, that's the neighbor, criticized Adam for not bringing in the trash cans on behalf of the elderly woman he lives with. I don't know who this elderly woman is, but Adam Abdul-Jabbar lives with an elderly woman, and this neighbor is annoyed that the younger guy doesn't pull the trash cans in. That apparently is the motivation. Any thoughts so far? I'm I'm going to have to hold him back. I, I really have a lot to say about this one, Anna. Okay. All right. Let me go on with the details. Here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me go on with the details. So as we said, they share a driveway and this seems to be where the dispute is. They got into a heated argument and um, Windsor says that Abdul Jabbar said, I'm going to put a knife through your teeth. He thought he was joking and it's a pretty weird thing to say too. So Windsor walks away. And as he's walking away, this is the neighbor. He says he thought he felt like he was being punched, but really he was being stabbed. So um, I don't think that there's a dispute that Adam Abdul-Jabbar stabbed him, but I suppose in the law and courtrooms, things like this can be disputed. So Windsor's wife rushed him to the hospital. He collapsed and as a result of being stabbed in the back of the head, um, the skull was fractured, there was bleeding, and Windsor claims he nearly died because of the attack. And, of course, police took this seriously. Uh, and, 
again, this dispute's been going on for years. Now, this is what Windsor told a local television station. I sort of got on him because the lady who takes care of him is 83 years old. He doesn't do anything for her, and it just bums me out. And apparently, you know, she's on a walker as she's taking the trash. So Adam Abdul-Jabbar was booked on suspicion of assault with a deadly weapon, and he was released later after posting bail. The neighbor says, I think he's got some serious problems. I think he tried to kill me. I mean it. I think he. I was within an inch of my life. Um... And apparently, Adam Abdul-Jabbar went to Windsor's wife afterwards to apologize. However, when um, the media, you know, cameras were waiting for Adam to come out to his car and they asked him again, you know, did you apologize to the wife? Do you have anything to say? He had nothing to say. And his father, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, has also had no comment on this. So what happens with this case? So uh, a few things. The first thing I, I have to say, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a fellow Bruin like me, and he is the ultimate mensch. So my heart goes out to him right now because I think having your son accused of something like this must be very difficult. So the way that we hear the story right now is from Windsor, who seems very, very sympathetic, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at this case, and Sean Hawley, actually, right now, it seems like is retained by Adam Abdul-Jabbar. Sean Hawley was of uh, Cochrane Law Firm fame. She represented La Lohan. Um, I would love to go to coffee with her, frankly. I'm sure she has a lot of stories. But she came out guns blazing. And she said, look, there's a lot that people don't know here. She said, Adam was the one who called 9-11. And that's always a fact that we, as a defense attorney, love when you look at a self-defense case. Now, you made a great point. There's no disputing who the participants were here, right? We know their identities, and we know one ended up in the hospital. Now, something that's kind of odd is California, where this happened, is a stand-your-ground state. And we really don't think of California being a stand-your-ground state, but mm -hmm. it is. You have no duty to retreat. So. What kind of facts might we look for if we're going to do a self-defense claim? What if we find out that Windsor, bless his heart, I don't know any of this, but let's just say person two, if we had a case like this, had a long history of assaultive conduct or maybe brandished weapons at Adam Abdul-Jabbar in the past. So those are the kind of things that I would look at if I'm trying to do a self-defense case. Now, the other thing that we don't know is why does this person, why does Adam have a caretaker? And are there mental health issues here? And is this a situation where we maybe have diminished capacity? So just off the top of my head, I, I think this case sounds at first blush really open and shut. But one of the things that I love about my job is the details. And the details that come out are sometimes the real bread and butter of your case. So, so you th so you think that Adam Abdul Jabbar that his argument and defense may be that it was self defense? Correct. It, certainly in in this kind of a case that is what I as a defense attorney if we could have the facts bear it out that's what I'd have to do. Evidence allows in self defense case for us as defense attorneys to bring up the character and reputation of the alleged victim. Now on the other hand it, it opens the door to anything that our client has done in the past. So it's a dangerous thing. I have a question, Danielle. So let's say that it is self-defense. And let's say that the neighbor maybe antagonized Adam Abdul-Jabbar. Even if those things are true, the fact that he allegedly stabbed him in the way that he stabbed him, I mean, that nothing negates that, right? Fair enough, you might prosecute this case well, uh, because <laughs> here's, here's the problem. The, the law allows for people to use reasonable force necessary to combat fear of great bodily injury, right? But the force has to be no more than necessary to deal with that threat. And so this hunting knife, I'd love to see it, right? Because in our minds, it's what, 18 inches long? Or it could be. Maybe it's a very small knife. 
right? And, and we don't know until we see the medical records, until we see what's going on. We don't know what kind of force this was. Certainly when you bring in the element of someone who's alleged to be unarmed, right? And then we add in a, in a knife, that that can be scary. But there's no law that says per se, you, you know, you can't use a knife to defend yourself against the threat of fists. I just think these disputes with between and among neighbors, they are the most dangerous things. They fester and fester and fester and boom, they explode. Absolutely. And it happens to everyone. It doesn't matter how educated you are, how wealthy you are, that you're a celebrity. You just go berserk over the neighbor that drives you crazy. Absolutely. I've, it's worse than road rage. It's yep. in your home. It happens all the time. I mm -hmm. probably shouldn't say this, but we might have a neighbor who always parks in front of our house. And I know that neighbor. I think he visits me. <laughs> he visits my street, yep. that neighbor. And we may use his name as now an adjective uh, <laughs> for people who like to take spaces that aren't theirs, right? Yes. But it's such mm -hmm. a silly thing, right? And we're normal people and we're well-adjusted people. But what happens in our home, in our safe space, right, where we want to just feel yeah. calm, drives us crazy. Yes, it does. So Abdul Jabbar has been charged with three felony counts of assault with a deadly weapon, one felony count of carrying a dagger. I didn't know there was such a thing. And a three enhancements of inflicting great bodily injury. Abdul Jabbar's arraignment is scheduled for September 9th, and he faces a maximum sentence of nine years, eight months in state prison if convicted. It is a very serious series of charges. Certainly. It, it really is. Okay, it's time to move on to our comment section. These are the crime stories you all are talking about. A Florida man hit a Disney security guard over dispute over the use of a face mask at Epcot Center. The man was upset because he was told that he and his family needed to change the kind of face mask that they were wearing. They're in line to go inside, and Disney has its own coronavirus rules about how you're going to enter and what you're going to be wearing. So the dad allegedly smacked the Epcot security guard because he didn't like what he was being told. Deputies say that Enrico Toro arrived at the park with his wife and his three children. But when they arrived at the check-in area, security guards again told him, you don't have the right mask. They do everything and they've changed the mask, except one of the kids still doesn't have the right mask that meets the Disney standards. And that's when the altercation Ensues, deputies say that Toro, 35, became irate, irate, began cursing and said, call the police. They will have to shoot me to leave. Not very logical. Not a good response. Um, Toro's wife intervened, pulled her husband away. She told, oh, and as she's pulling him away, the father's telling the security guard, and I know where you live, right? Further threatening to kill the man. So Toro is accused of hitting the guard in the head, threatening to kill him. He was arrested and charged with misdemeanor battery. I'm telling you, this pandemic is pushing people to the limit. I, I've had that conversation yesterday, actually, with my investigator. Uh, people are at their breaking point, and there's just a lack of civility and general kindness that is is really unfortunate and and who knows right who knows what someone's going through who knows if they scrape together their last amount of money to you know show their kids disneyland certainly though the allegations uh, make him the anti-mensch it was not it was really naughty behavior if he did it um but I, I think that point is well taken this we're, we're to our breaking point anna we really we are, are. we are and clearly this man broke uh, Daryl G. writes, he'll never be back. Mickey has his fingerprint now. Melody N. writes, this is about the most calm Florida man story I've ever seen. Florida man's a, a, a I, running I thing here. I love that I think that's, yeah, <laughs> that's like it's a right. running thing here at Drew Crime. <laughs> and then Steffi L. writes, imagine punching someone at Disney World. That's a completely different level of trash. Oh, it's just a horrible story. And then the kids had to witness this. And then the kids also who were standing in line had to Couldn't witness go. this. It's too Couldn't much. go to Disneyland. Just stop it. Okay. Our next, our next story. A Memphis man allegedly cut his ex-girlfriend's brake line to her car. He has now been charged with attempted murder. What is wrong with people? 
The woman said that she got off work and she was heading home when she noticed that her brake light was on. So she had a mechanic check. And when he looked, he said, lady, your problem is somebody cut the line. So she went to the cops and police obtained surveillance video of the woman's uh, from the woman's work. And that reportedly showed the ex-boyfriend, Jaime Martinez, tampering with her car while she was at work. I always say people, cameras everywhere, everywhere. Hello. All right. Just just bad. Just very bad. Cameras everywhere. We're always being recorded. We're always being watched. Um, and I can't help but geek out because they charge these cases in California also as assaults. And the the touching is the cutting of the brake line. It's it's pretty terrifying. And there's this interesting interplay between the act, which is just a tiny cut, right? And and the possible consequences, which are dire. She could have died uh, or been 100%. seriously injured and Thank God she wasn't. And did this Jaime Martinez really think about what this was going to do? I mean, she could have died. Or killed someone else, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Kathy G writes, this is an example of why you are an ex. Dumb, dumb. Barbara B writes, why on earth would they release him so he can find another way to kill her? That's a very good point because... If he's angry, now he's really angry. And then Lorena D writes, they gave him a break. Okay. (laughs) That's it for our episode this week. Danielle, thank you so much. I have so enjoyed talking with you and your insight. Danielle, where can people find you if they either need an attorney or they just want to follow you on social media? Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be here. You can find me on my new Instagram page at Iredale Law. I-R-E-D-A-L-E, law. And you can also find me on my website, Iredale Criminal Defense. So I look forward to hearing comments and I look forward to helping people that I can help. Excellent. Thank you, Danielle. We wish you the best of luck. Again, uh, if you're looking for me, you know where to find me. I'm um, at Anna G News. That's Anna with one N on all social media platforms. And as you know, if you're a regular listener, subscriber, watcher, I love to interact with you. I love to hear your comments. I can't wait to hear your comments on the cases this week. Uh, I I love the forum that we have, that we get to connect. And I thank you once again for making this one of the best YouTube channels ever if you follow us there because we now have 4 million subscribers. And we thank you, thank you, thank you. We need to come up with like 4 million refrigerator magnets if anybody's listening to me. Uh, Okay, as always, you can find all of our content uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, of course, on YouTube. And you can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.